Stockholm Syndrome by Jim Cogan. He had no idea how long they'd kept him captive in the village. From the great stone prison they built for him, high on an earthen mound overlooking the centre, he could sense the bustle all around him in the huts, latrines and cookhouses. The sounds and smells from the food stores and the pens where they kept the animals. Dozens, maybe hundreds of animals, so many for a settlement of that size. At night, the silence was total. No feasting or music, no muted grunts of pleasure from human or beast. A deadness reigned over everything, as it had in the metamorphic womb of the mountain where they'd come upon him resting. By day, they would cluster around him and look, men, women, and children, faces of those who'd journeyed far for a glimpse, knapsacks in colours he'd never seen before, slick black oblongs that looked to be carved out of jet but weren't, held up to flash at him through the glass. In summer, the adults wore glistening blinkers of a similar colour. They seldom stared for long, partly because the sight of him was such a disappointment. A great meandering slab of curled up rock, barely recognisable for what it was, like a half-carved idol, or, as some of them occasionally joked, <laughs> a gigantic pile of dung. Few lingered long enough for their hearts and eyes to settle for the telltale features to suggest themselves against the grey-black mass, the unlikely symmetry of the ridges on his back, the slickness of the tongue tips twisting down over his carbuncled lip, the orbic bulge in the side of his head that was not a cooled magma bubble, but a closed eye the size of a glacier rock. Yes, they told themselves, Something of a disappointment. But mostly, they moved on because of fear. Fear of what they knew about him, yet refused to know. A fear they were unwilling to acknowledge, on top of all the other petty terrors their mortal existences heaped upon them. He received their fear, and, though it was alien to him, he understood it, accepting it for the gift it was. No one had ever seen him move. Through the lone window in the north wall of his cell, snow-capped peaks were visible, clouds riding their last on the summits, cliffs bearded with pine. Some way off was the stockade that protected the village from the outside. Several thousand vertical wooden poles of uniform diameter, their surfaces smooth as sand and stained a warm honey brown tops trimmed in a curve to follow the undulating rampart beyond, swathed in pristine green turf. At the bottom of the mound was a stone enclosure with its own miniature lake, inhabited by two polar bears. Although he couldn't read the inscription on the sign outside, he nonetheless knew their names were Brad and Angelina, mm -hmm. and that they had been named by a competition among the local school children. On the day they first installed him, Brad, and Angelina had begun roaring and refused to stop. Gradually, the other animals had followed suit until the air was alive with chattering, howling, hissing, trilling, spitting, squeaking and croaking. For days afterwards, many of the animals refused to eat. The keepers struggled to hold their nerve. After a week or two, the animals grew bored and got on with their lives. Later still, some tiger cubs were born and even fewer visitors came to see him. The window, which made up the entire north wall of his cell, was made of reinforced glass, a palladium alloy several inches thick with a blast resistant factor of 150. Beyond it was a terrace dotted with chairs, tables and parasols, as well as a kiosk selling beer, ice cream, fries and ice cream, fries and paper cones, and a wide range of other mouth-watering treats and snacks. Much of this he saw through the hairline crack beneath the lid of his right eye. Sometimes visitors would catch a glow there, 
a vague impression of awareness before shoving the idea from their minds. But most of it, he simply knew. He knew about the vast bituminous rectangle outside the stockade where the people alighted from their chariots and left them in geometric ranks as if waiting for a battle that would never come. Chariots that were beast and conveyance all in one, demanding neither hay nor water, their battle armour fused with their hide as his was, their grills and spoilers emblazoned with the shields of their respective tribes, diamonds and intersecting circles, griffins, lions, and the occasional prancing horse. He knew that the blood in their veins was a distant cousin to the igneous rivers lying dormant in his own, and that they slept and awoke as the people decreed. He longed to set these metal creatures free, just as he longed to set the people free, free of their fear, even if that meant freeing them of their lives. Fear clung to them, he saw it in the furtive glances they shot at one another's backs, even those whose car keys bore the same tribal emblem. He saw it in the compulsive, jittery way they checked their watches and wallets, heard it in the way they snapped at their children, sensed it from the way they prodded at their black plastic devices and swallowed their food without chewing. Whatever the nature of these fears, he knew that they were useless, eating away at their innards and distracting them from the real monster in their midst. Memories kept him amused, dreamy memories from before his great sleep, of the miracles he'd seen fear accomplish, fathers running clean through the blast furnace of his breath to rescue wives and children, the shield maiden who kept on coming at him even after his tail blade had locked off her arm at the shoulder. These people were the same but bewitched, asleep, buried alive in their own flesh. Look at me, he urged them. See me, say my name and free me. He was wise enough to know there was no such thing as magic, only what was known to work. So far, not one of them had dared to name him. Certainly not the president of the coal conglomerate, who had looked upon the newly decapitated mountain and sensed his form deep within the rock, then abruptly resigned his post to live in a faraway land that derived its power solely from wind. Mm -hmm. Not the chief geologist, who after extraction had noted the claw-like appendages on either side of this miraculous new fossil, yet failed to explain its imperviousness to x-rays, dynamite, or tungsten carbide. Nor even the zoo director, who had rolled his eyes when the trustees voted to accept the monster rock as a gift from their conservation partners, the coal conglomerate. He could never quite explain his decision to model the display cage on a nuclear bunker. Every month, a dozen zookeepers would outsail down from the roof and scrub him with wire brushes, <laughs> unaware of how much it tickled. They would shudder at his chilly exterior, trying to suppress the nagging suspicion that it was only skin deep. Those who were most afraid would tap dance on his back or hammer out a chart-topping bass line on his tailplates. Months went by, then years. Still, no one dared to name him, in word or in thought. No one. Until the boy. It was midsummer. The crowds outside the Hilltop prison were thicker than usual, emboldened by sunshine and beer. The boy was eleven. His matchstick limbs sprouting from Converse sneakers into knee-length black shorts, black hair long enough to graze the Ramones t-shirt his grandfather had given him. He stood a little way back from the crush between the tables. His parents and siblings had disappeared in search of lemurs, but the boy's eyes never strayed from the great ridged back just visible above the gawkers' heads. In the prisoner, something stirred. 
the crack beneath his eyelid widened a fraction. A small girl gasped and tugged at her mother's sleeve. None of the adults noticed. He knew the time had come, and he was grateful. The boy's lips barely moved as he whispered the word, but the thought from which it sprang echoed through the cell. The dragon's skin cracked as he smiled. A few of the onlookers thought they heard thunder and stepped back, eyes searching the heavens. He caught a fleeting glimpse of the boy before a tall, fat man passed between them, licking ice cream. He gave a small cough. The window of his cell blew out in a supersonic puff of reinforced nano splinters that dissolved the people directly in front of the building and ripped great chunks from anyone walking behind. A silent shockwave travelled down the hill, overturning prams and hurling day trippers into walls. The tanks in the reptile house exploded, vomiting cotton mouths and anacondas. A family of leopards toppled from their tree. Outside the compound, 300 car alarms went off in unison. For a while, the day's stillness. Up on the hill, the dragon yawned. His erstwhile observers were raining down around him in a seat of blood, bone, and excrement. He pushed himself upright, shrugging the roof off his cell. Everything below him was a fog of red. He blew gently and without fire until the mist parted and the boy stared back at him, ankle deep in a crimson sludge. He wore the remains of the fat man's body like a damp mantle, his eyes gleaming white through the ball. A bloody spit bubble fattened and burst in his gaping mouth. From down the hill, a single low wail was swiftly joined by stricken laments of every pitch and timbre, the screams of men and of panicked animals. From deep within the dragon's body, great wings burst, shattering the walls and sending blocks of concrete high into the air, over the boy's head and down the hill in all directions, crushing those too slow or stunned to run away. He looked to one side. More enclosures, more animals huddled in corners, climbing the walls or throwing their bodies against the bars in a vain attempt to escape. The dragon closed his eyes and laughed a great laugh. And when he looked again, everything he had laughed at was blackened and gone, the air laden with the stench of burned fur. The sun and sky had vanished. He flapped his wings, lifting his body clear of the rubble. As he did so, the boy threw off the fat man's skin and began staggering away. The dragon spoke to him, not in words, but in the form of a thought bomb that kicked the boy with such force that it lifted him clear off the ground. Run! The boy landed, his ankles held, and he ran. The dragon turned in the air, his tail shearing the roof off the tropical pavilion. A thousand exquisitely coloured butterflies rose withered and tore in the poisonous breeze. Through the smoke, he saw Brad and Angelina making a dash across their lake for the safety of their cave. He blew them a kiss and watched them boil. He beat his wings, flying higher through the roof of his own desolation until he saw the sun and sky once again, the peaks and lowlands dropping away towards the coast. In the distance, the skyline of a city, its windows glinting in the fire. Blue lights on the fringes of the smoke, sirens gaining in front of them. Forty kilometres away, an offshore wind farm winked its impotent fins. He saw, beyond the tips of the mountains, gathering speed. Looking back, he saw the wind ripping holes in the smoke, the boy running as bitten across the grassy picnic area towards the exit, dodging the dead and the dying. The dragon, jackknifed in midair, boomeranged back on himself and began to dive, eyes fixed on his quarry. 
millennia of experience told him the boy had a one in seven chance of escaping. Good odds. And if he should survive, the rewards of his fear, this acute, extreme and nourishing fear, would be incalculable. The dragon smiled and let gravity take it.